there everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for our webinar on calibration types for vector network analysis. We thank you for your attendance and participation. If you have any feedback or other webinar topic suggestions, then please let me know by chat or you can email me later at support at testforce.com. Uh, and before we get started, I'd just like to let everyone know that this webinar will be recorded and you will be receiving an email afterwards with a copy of the recording. So you can go ahead and share it with anyone you think would be interested or rewatch it if you'd like. If you're interested in any of the other webinars we will be hosting or to download any of the free resources we have available, such as white papers or application notes, please go ahead and visit testforce.com slash academy and you'll find everything you need right there. If during the webinar you have any questions, make sure that you ask them in the Q&A section in the right side menu bar and we will be sure to get to all of those questions as we get to the end of the presentation. And now, without further ado, let's jump right in and talk about calibration types for vector network analysis with Brian Walker. Thank you, Rebecca. I appreciate that. I think this is going to be a, a very interesting uh, webinar. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, calibration types. So I'll jump right to the agenda. Uh, we're going to talk about... Um, uh, we're going to start with uh, SOLT and SOLR, or sold in solar in, uh, in slang terminology. Uh, we're going to talk about how the standards are defined, uh, what the uh, short and shorts and opens should look like. Uh, we'll talk about what an unknown through is, which is the difference between SOLT and SOLR. Uh, and we'll, um, the errors that are removed by calibration, I actually moved to the end of this presentation because it's a fairly involved subject, and I think it deserves a, probably an hour all on its own. So I'll just introduce the errors that are being corrected. Uh, we'll talk about some of them, and if there's a lot of interest, and if there's time, we'll continue. Uh, then we'll talk about TRL. Uh, you know, what is needed to perform TRL calibration? What are the advantages? What are the pitfalls? Whoops, mixed. And then waveguide calibration, uh, SSLT, short, short load through. Uh, what calibration pieces are used? Uh, for waveguide, we can do an SOLT-like calibration. And of course, we can do TRL. So let's start with SOLT. Uh, I think most people are familiar with uh, short, open, load, and through calibration. This is a coaxial calibration. I'm holding in my hand a T4311, which is a uh, self-contained calibration kit with a short, open, load, and through. Uh, it, the, uh, the definition of the through has a defined delay. And for solar, which we'll, I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, the uh, for solar you can use any through that you like as long as it's reciprocal. That is S12 is equal to S21. We can use the through that's built into this, or we could use another through that we had on our bench, perhaps. Uh, the calibration process is identical for salt or solar. Let's talk about the open standard right here. An ideal open standard would look like uh, the cross section of an ideal transmission line with radial electric fields which stop abruptly at the slice. I think you can imagine the, uh, the, the uh, propagation of an EM uh, wave through a, a piece of coax. You know that the electric lines of force are radial and there's a uh, circular uh, magnetic field as well. If you were to cut that cleanly and keep that same configuration of electric and magnetic fields, you would have a perfect open, but you can't do that because the electric fields curve at the ends from the center conductor out to the, uh, out to the ground. And that looks like a small capacitor. And, uh, and in fact, uh, an open that we design like this has a connector, a small delay, and then basically the open itself. So let's look at that. Here's a, in this slide, I, I can, I show a, a good electrical model of the open that's in this, 
unit. It has a defined delay. It has a uh, it has a, a known capacitance that accounts for the fringing fields at the end. So uh, it can be characterized by a third order polynomial, and I've shown it as c equals c zero plus c one times f plus c two times f squared plus c c three times f cubed. A loss term which increases linearly with frequency might also be included in that. So this is a this is a uh, third order polynomial characterization of the capacitance after a short delay. So where's my dot? I have people ask this. So for this particular cal piece, the delay is 28.353 picoseconds from the connector to the actual open. And the capacitance at the end of that delay is defined by uh, by these coefficients. It's uh, minus 4.3 times 10 to the minus 15, minus 431 times 10 to the minus 25, and so on times f and f squared and f cubed. Uh, the actual values here don't make too much uh, difference as long as they fit the capacitance well is all that really matters. Does it, it's hard to make any physical sense out of this. So from 9 kilohertz to 6.5 gigahertz, if I plot this polynomial of capacitance with 28.353 picoseconds of delay in front of it, it looks like this. It looks like a 9 kilohertz, it looks like a pretty good open, but it proceeds clockwise around the Smith chart until it reaches about minus 132 degrees. A real open does not look like a dot. So let's let's actually look at that. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so now uh, I have on my screen the uh, the software that's uh, that's running on a 6.5 gigahertz compact uh, vector network analyzer, which you saw. Not again. Okay. Uh, is the video showing the VNA as well? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, so you can see the VNA. Uh, I'm going to perform a, uh, a full two port calibration on the VNA using this calibration kit. I'm going to apply the open, the short, and the load on the first side, then the open, short, and load on the second side, and then I'm going to do a through calibration. I'm going to do this so fast that you can't see it. I'm actually going to cheat. So I've uh, I actually just recalled the calibration that I previously did with this because you don't need to see me attaching each of the each of these things to the cables. But having done this, let's go ahead and look at the open. Let's see how that compares my calculation. I'm going to torque it. So you can see I have a clockwise arc from 9 kilohertz to 6.5 gigahertz that ends at minus 131 and change degrees. Keep in mind that we usually go from zero here to plus 180 and zero to minus 180 on the screen. That's usually how we do this. So here is our open. It's not a dot. So when I calibrated, when I did the proper one port calibration with this device, if I go back and look at the open, I should see exactly what that polynomial and that delay uh, describe, and I do. Then you can see that the, uh, the plot of uh, this capacitance and this delay on a Smith chart correctly predicts the actual performance of this device. It's not bad. So a real open does not look like a dot. Does not look like a dot. Does not look like a dot at zero degrees. It looks like an arc. The short, an ideal short standard, would look like a perfect short with no inductance. But of course, that's impossible. In the real world, there's a small delay between the connector 
and the actual short inside the standard. And that short has a finite inductance. So the short can be defined by a small transmission line followed by an inductance to ground, which is characterized by a third order polynomial over frequency. Here's that polynomial. Uh, I'm showing L equals L0 plus L1 times F, L2 times F squared plus L3 times F cubed. And again, a loss term might be included in this, which would cause the, uh, the plot to spiral in, inward slightly. So for this calibration standard, it's actually the T4311, the delay is 28.353 picoseconds and the capacitance, um, whoops, the inductance is defined by, I have a couple of typos here. The inductance is defined by this polynomial. And in this case, uh, these the coefficients are all zero because the inductance is negligible for the short in this calibration piece. So for that case, which is all due to the delay, we have an arc from nine kilohertz to 6.5 gigahertz, which starts at a at the short at 180 degrees and arcs clockwise to 48 degrees. A real short does not look like a dot. It looks like an arc. So if you calibrate and then reattach your calibration piece, you should see an arc. And if you do, your calibration is good. So through versus unknown through. Earlier, when I did the calibration, I had a choice between the characterized through, which has a, an actual delay associated with this through, or I could have chosen the unknown through. And when I did the calibration earlier, which you didn't see, I chose unknown through. And, it, and when I did that, I won't be able to show it here precisely, but when I attached the through and then chose unknown through, the VNA measured the through and, and it, it decided it determined what the delay was through it by finding out where the where the phase is flat. So it increases from zero slightly, the delay more and more and more until the phase becomes flat, or the delay is zero, if you like, uh, the effective. And at that point, uh, the, uh, the through has been basically characterized by the VNA. It uses that delay rather than one that you give it, and then it performs the calibration. So in SOLT, the characterized through must be a very high quality and properly characterized. Uh, errors in that through definition will result in ripples in an S21 or S12 measurement uh, or in the pass band of a filter, for example. So if you actually have, a, if you actually perform a calibration and you measure a filter and you're looking at the pass band, you know that the pass band is flat and you see strange ripples in it. Uh, you can bet that what's happened is that your through calibration has a problem. The reason for that is that the through mostly, mostly compensates for the transmission tracking error. That's the frequency response from the stimulus at port one, through the cable, through the dot, through the other cable, through the bridge, and to the digitizer. That frequency response is the transmission tracking error, or the, the error from flatness anyway, from the error from perfectly flat. So that lack of flatness is, is characterized and the uh, transmission tracking correction is applied to the measurement. If the phase is, uh, is incorrect, that is the, uh, the through characterization that you did earlier, uh, you used a, uh, used a delay for your through, which was not appropriate for the through, then the uh, correction that is done will have a phase error. And that phase error will rotate around and around as, as you're making your measurement, and it will create ripples. So, let's get back to this. Unknown through, and uh, unknown through, or SOLR calibration, is free of this deficiency. You won't have a problem with uh, an error in the delay of your through, because the VNA determines what it is. 
Uh, for more information on that, there's a link here, which uh, has, there's a pretty good article on our website, which talks about unknown through and SOLR calibration. And I'll leave it at that for now. Database calibration standards. So in the earlier examples, the, the calibration standard, this one, defined by uh, third order polynomials for the short and the open, and the load is assumed to be a perfect 50 ohms. Well, is that exactly true? The polynomial is the same for the opens and the shorts uh, for every one of these produced. And so we're making the assumption that uh, every one of these is perfectly machined and fabricated in the same way. And so that the polynomial characterization is correct for every single one of these produced. Well, that can't possibly be true. There will be small errors or small differences from one calibration piece to another. So the polynomial isn't perfect. Uh, also, the load itself is assumed to be a perfect 50 ohm load, and we know that's not true. So how can we improve that? We can do uh, we can perform a database uh, calibration, or we can create a database standard. Uh, that's created by, I could do that with this, by measuring the short, the open, and the load with a golden VNA and, and characterize each of these pieces. I can also characterize the uh, two port response of the through. And then these are stored in a calibration definition with the S parameter files. That's much more accurate than the polynomial characterization of this. So if you have a database calibration kit, it's going to be more accurate. And um, for more information on calibration kits, there's a link at the bottom. And I should mention that um, in terms of accuracy, the polynomial derived uh, mechanical kit is, uh, uh, is good. The database kits are better. And the very best is to use an automatic calibration module or an ACM that we produce. And the ACM has uh, uh, is an automatic calibration we produce, performs the open, short, and load, and it has all those built into it. It does the switching, and it also has a confidence check feature at the end, so you can verify that your calibration was done properly. So I'll open up for questions on SOLT and SOLR. We do have two. <clears throat> um, William, William asked, when recalling states that are saved with the cow, I noted that the CAL standard and the system impedance is not always loaded or updated. I assume this does not affect the loaded CAL data, but is the correct behavior of the system. Oh, interesting. The, um, it turns out that the, the system impedance, uh, well, it, I don't want to switch back over to the, uh, to the UI of the VNA because it's too hard to get back to the slides. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the characteristic impedance of the VNA is determined by entries in the, uh, in the, Oops. sorry, uh, this, it is, uh, I'll hold it. I'm sorry. Okay. The uh, characteristic impedance of the VNA is determined by the uh, entries in the calibration kit definition. So the short, open, and load are all, uh, uh, there's an entry next to them that says 50 ohms, 50 ohms, 50 ohms. For the characteristic impedance. If it said 75, for instance, then uh, when you were finished with calibration, the VNA would be calibrated for 75 ohms. And if you looked on the on the tab where the characteristic impedance is set, it'll say 75. So I'm surprised that when you call a state, when you recall a state that has a calibration associated with it, that it would uh, uh, that the characteristic impedance might be anything other than what is stated in the, cal in the calibration kit that was performed prior to saving the state. Um, let's talk about that particular case later if, uh, if, if you still have that issue. Uh, but I am a little surprised, so I'm, I'm not aware of that. Um, William had another question. For unknown through, how does one define multiple frequency points for delay characterization, or is this completed only at center of the measurement band? For delay characterization? Mm -hmm. The, um, is that with a, is that with a cal kit? 
Um, can you reread the question? I'm yes, sorry. I sure can. For unknown through, how does one define multiple frequency points for delay characterization? Uh, or is this a, is this completed only at the center of the measurement band? Oh, <laughs> oh, um, yes. The un, good question. The um, the unknown through uh, the unknown through uh, characterization, to my knowledge, uh, assumes um, uh, solves for the flattest phase. So yes, there could be uh, some wiggles in the phase indicating dispersion and indicating that uh, the delay through the through the through is not constant. Um, that I don't think is is uh, I don't think that's accounted for in solar. Uh, so it will do its best to fit a, a linear fit to that. Uh, on the other hand, a data based through would would take care of that. Okay. Um, next question, we have quite a few questions. Um, in the open and load measurements not being a dot and being an arc, is that because of the frequency span being so large that you're using? Um, yeah, sort of. Um, at uh, Clearly at uh, nine kilohertz, which is where I started, uh, an open really does look like uh, zero and a short looks like 180 degrees. And the higher you go in frequency, uh, the the farther the arc goes clockwise. Now, if we were only operating at a high frequency, say 6.4 to 6.5 gigahertz, we wouldn't see the arc even starting at the at the uh, you know anticipated place at 180. It would start somewhere up and only only be a small arc. Uh, so that can be a little disconcerting, uh, particularly if you've only done if you've done a calibration say from 6.4 to 6.5 gigahertz, and you now you attach the open. And now you see a tiny arc at 42 degrees. That doesn't look like an open at all, but that really is what it should be because that's just the portion of the arc that, that we saw earlier. Okay, how do I make a silver standard from a golden standard kit? Oh, hmm. Well, um, all right, to my knowledge, there are, um, there are a couple of kinds of standard kits. One is a primary standard. A primary standard kit is one that is characterized by NIST um, and it, it lives in its own little box and it never comes out unless you're using it to verify your secondary standards. It stays in the lab. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a full set here and uh, our calibration lab manager won't let me near it. So uh, the Primary standards are used to verify the secondary standards. Secondary standards are generally used for day-to-day -day calibration of, uh, of test instrumentation. And I would say that uh, good calibration kits that you purchase from a reputable source uh, would be very similar in performance to uh, secondary standards that uh, derive from the primary. Uh, you can also buy economical grade uh, standards, but I don't recommend them, and they're like a third tier. Um, how can you, uh, how can you, uh, how, how can, what's the best you can do? I think the best you can do in terms of, uh, of, of improving a CAL kit that you already have, you can have your CAL kit database by someone who has a, a very, very good uh, CAL kit, perhaps uh, a primary standard. If you had that done, then your cal kit would be about as good as it can get until it starts to wear. Okay. Are all solar calibrations unknown through? Um, yes, to my knowledge, uh, SOL, the R means reciprocal and it means, um, it, it means that uh, an, an, a small unknown through is used. Uh, do beware, uh, you can't use a really, really long through for that because uh, you can end up with uh, multiple roots. There's, a, there's an equation that's solved, that is solved for that. And if you have more than one root, it's a problem. So it needs to be short like this, usually, a bullet. Easy question. Do you offer ACMs up to 20 gigahertz? Oh, we do. Yes, we do. We, do. we have two uh, both two and four ports. That's the ACM 2520 and 4520. Yes. yes, good. Um, and the last question we have here, are the open and short traces non-dot corrected after the SOL and thus obtaining a dot? Ah, 
That's a beautiful question. I'm glad you asked that. From your friend Manuel. I'm glad you asked that. Um, the um, you might think that um, uh, you're taking this open, which is not really a nice open. It's an arc, and you calibrate. And when you're done, when you measure it, you should get a dot. But that's not true because what you're measuring is what this really is. It's not a dot. It's a starts like a dot at nine kilohertz, but it really is an arc. So you have to tell the VNA what this is, and that's what that polynomial is all about, or the database. Uh, we tell the VNA that this is an arc. It's not a dot. And so we calibrate it. It looks at it. It uh, it makes a correction to the polynomial that he, the, that uh, we tell it. And when we're finished and we measure this, it accurately measures this arc. It is an arc, it's not a dot. So great question. People ask that all the time. And uh, a PhD asked me this question, a PhD in uh, RF. And uh, so uh, it's a popular misconception. All right, we have more questions popping in, lots of questions. Um, with portable and USB powered VNAs, I observed small variations in the curves during calibration, depending on how I was touching the cases, meaning some leakage on the outer case shielding. Is there a way to improve or stabilize measurements with such a small device? Oh, uh, is he, uh, the cases of the dots, is this what we're talking about? Or are we talking about the cases? He said that during the calibration. So the cases of the calibration pieces. I suppose, yes. Can you clarify, David? Mm. That's what you were meaning. Uh, if we're talking about uh, small variations due to um, RF crawling on the outside of the case of the uh, calibration piece, um, yes, that can be an issue. Um, and generally, um, it's, I do it all the time, but it's really best to attach the calibration standard and then set it down. Um, and, and let me show one other thing too, by the way. Um, I can fix it pretty easily. All right. Oops. There we are. Oh, thanks, Rebecca. Just don't need to. <laughs> now you know what Rebecca looks like. Um, so uh, there will be there will be probably some RF crawling on this. It's kind of hard to avoid, um, and touching it will affect um, the fields. And so it's probably best to attach the short and then take your hands away. And that's really the best way to do this. Also, I want to show just one other thing uh, about calibration. Note the way I have these cables. Uh, cables generally have a preferred bend, and I have them set to their preferred bend. If I had turned this 180 degrees and then bend it against its preferred direction, I, I will get more phase change in the cable. I don't care who makes the cable. They, have, they generally have this preferred bend, and you're going to want to use it the way it is. So, uh, so yes, you're going to get your best performance if you attach the we have a clarification from David. He said, yes, the case of the VNA device. Okay, well, um, then yes, um, make your attachment, take your hands away. Um, hands and things uh, do tend to affect measurements. Uh, your, your best calibration is actually going to be done if you uh, place the VNA on the, on the table, tape the cables down to the table, and then uh, apply the standards, take the standards away, put your dot in the middle, and do all of this without moving the cables. That's the best way to do it. It's difficult to do, but that is the best way. Okay. <clears throat> Does the solar calibration depend on the unknown through's characteristic impedance? Oh, uh, yes. Yes, it, it would. Um, the, um, um, the assumption is the assumption is made that it is a 50 ohm or a 75 ohm impedance for the, for the VNA. Yes. Um, I believe this is a duplicate question, so I'm going to mm -hmm. gloss over that. Is the quality of the calibration of a segmented table the same? I'm sorry, the what? The quality of the calibration of a segmented table the same? Uh, yes. Um, the quality is the same. Of course, for each segment, you can choose uh, more or less points. 
So calibration only applies at the points that uh, you're calibrating. So if there are strange things going on in between points, you do have to be a little careful. I have seen, uh, I have seen companies that want to test uh, their dots very, very fast. They'll set up segments. And in some cases, they might only have two points in a segment. And I've seen where uh, the depth that they're testing has things going on in between those two points, and uh, and they might be passing or failing a component uh, and, and not really know what, what's happening. So you have, you have to have the right number of points, and, um, and then every point is calibrated in, in every segment. Um, and each segment can have a different resolution bandwidth, and so there's a lot of interesting things you can do with segments. Um, at lower frequencies, say up to 500 megahertz, what are your thoughts on accuracy of the calibration if you don't place an open standard for the cow and leave the cable connector open without the standard attached? Oh, um, at, hmm, hard to say. At, uh, at low frequencies, it would sort of depend on the connector. Um, there's certainly going to be uh, there's certainly going to be a, quite a lot of fringing of, of an SMA connector here. Uh, there's a pin sticking out, and around it is uh, around it is the um, is the outer uh, ground here. So there'll be fringing from that pin to that to the ground. There'll be a lot more capacitance here uh, than um, uh, than you might expect. Uh, the delay will be zero. So there's that. Um, so it's kind of a trade-off. I'd say uh, probably to 100 megahertz, it wouldn't be too bad. 500 megahertz is probably pushing it uh, a little bit. Uh, keep in mind that um, uh, there's also some inductance. There's going to be the inductance of the center pin going out into the into the wild here. Uh, its uh, inductance is 25 nanohenries per inch, roughly. So this looks like it's about a tenth of an inch, so it's 2.5 nanohenries. Find out what the inductance of, or find out what the reactance of 2.5 nanohenries is, and factor that into the error of uh, leaving this open, and that's going to give you some idea of what kind of issues you might be facing. Okay, for your systems, do you note any accuracy issues if the VNA is not grounded to Earth? Oh. Um, I would not expect. Um, I would not expect. I would not expect a big problem there. Uh, but that being said, we do recommend that you uh, that you do ground the VNA, uh, particularly the portable. Uh, these portable VNAs. Uh, there's a ground. Uh, this little ground connector on the back. Uh, do ground that because otherwise it won't have one. Uh, the power connector comes from uh, a small a wall wall work kind of power supply and there's no there's no ground it's just uh, 12 volts coming in so without uh, without a ground attached you're going to be grounding based on whatever you're connecting this to and that's really not a good idea uh, will it affect your measurement probably not but you could get a ground loop uh, depending on what you're measuring that could uh, could destroy the vna when you make when you first make a connection to it okay so if you calibrate with higher points, i.e. 1600 points, all lower point scales, i.e. 801, are automatically calibrated. Yes. Um, if, you, if you choose a calibration, say, let's choose an even number, say 10,000. Uh, if you calibrate 10,000 points, then uh, at uh, 1,000 points, that's every 10. Uh, it would be perfectly calibrated at every tenth point. Let's say you chose something that didn't divide properly, like uh, 337 points. Then uh, it would still be calibrated, but it would be interpolated. Now that's fairly accurate because the points that you've, you've already done 10,000 point calibration, and you're interpolating with lots and lots of information. So, uh, so actually it's a quite a good idea to calibrate with lots of points and then back off to make your measurements so the measurement's not quite so slow. Interpolation is just fine. Extrapolation is not fine. So if you calibrate over range F1 to F2, don't expect to measure something outside of that range and have good accuracy. Okay. 
All right, let me go back. We have a couple more questions. In order to get the best possible measurement, we calibrate at a very high number of points and a very low IF bandwidth. Are we doing it right? Yes. Uh, a lot of points uh, gives you the ability, again, to back off as needed. Interpolation will give you good results. The, uh, the low IF bandwidth means that the noise uh, is, is down and uh, measurements that are made uh, at say minus 80 dB, minus 90 dB will be more accurate when the noise floor is significantly lower. Uh, keep in mind that uh, VNA measurements are not quite like receiver measurements. You could talk about a 10 dB signal to noise ratio in a receiver and you know maybe that's okay. A 10 dB signal to noise ratio in a VNA is not okay because we're talking about adding vectors together. In a receiver, we're talking about uh, perhaps adding uh, signals which add in a Gaussian way. In a Vic vector network analyzer, we're adding magnitudes of vectors which add according to a Rayleigh distribution. And that kind of adds another 10 dB of, uh, of, uh, from your noise floor. There's another 10 dB of peak that you have to account for um, due to the Rayleigh distribution. Uh, it's kind of a whole different subject, but it just means that uh, you don't want your measurement getting too close to the noise floor. 10 dB is too close, believe me. 20 dB, much better. 30 dB, good place to be. Okay, what is the best way to verify a calibration is good? Ah, um, well, hmm. I did the calculation earlier where I, uh, I had it... Uh, Still showing the slides? Yes. Yes. So I did the calculation here. This is what the short is supposed to look like. I could verify to my calibration, to my calculation. That's one way to do it. Um, the other way to uh, verify my calibration would be, um, let's see. Uh, that, that is difficult. <laughs> I think, uh, I think perhaps having this calculation done might be the only good way to uh, to verify a mechanical calibration kit. I can't think of any better way. Um, of course, the automatic calibration module, the ACM that we sell, has a uh, uh, an attenuator built into it that's been characterized at the factory, so that when you are done calibrating, you can pull in the measurement, uh, our measurement of that attenuator, and you'll see your measurement on top of it, where the uh, stored uh, that were our measurements in memory. And so you'll automatically be able to verify your, uh, your S21, your S11, your phase, anything you want to verify, you can verify using the ACM confidence check feature. So I'll have to tout that. That's really the best way. Um, if I change the CW power after calibration, should I recalibrate? Um, it depends. If you, uh, if you go very high, you're going to start moving into the... Uh, um, let's say you calibrate at zero and then go up. That's probably not a good idea because uh, you're going to start to move into the slight nonlinearity because uh, there is there is compression of the receivers on the uh, on the VNA. And uh, so if you're at plus five, it's good to calibrate at plus five. Uh, if you're um, if you're at zero, calibrate at zero. Now. If you want to make a measurement, though, at below zero, say minus 10, minus 20, minus 30, don't calibrate at minus 20. Calibrate at zero and then pull the power down. Otherwise, you're just going to have a lot of noise in your calibration. The linearity of the VNA from zero on down is great. Uh, above zero, you do have to watch out for compression. Okay. How much is the validity of a calibration change with changes to the IF bandwidth setting and or other hardware settings such as power attenuation, source power, et cetera? Uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, above zero, you do have to watch out for compression. Uh, you might not see very much of that. I mean, you have to get up to uh, the compression is something like plus 15 dB, I think, in the uh, receiver. So you have to uh, you'd have to be above five before you start seeing anything. But we're, we're talking about wanting to have accuracy on the order of 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 dB. So uh, we, we try not to uh, we try to do whatever we can to keep that uh, accuracy. So uh, again, 
uh, don't change the power going, don't go too high in power after you've calibrated it at zero, for instance. Other changes uh, are not an issue at all. Uh, you can change a resolution bandwidth, uh, no issues. Um, do watch out for temperature. We do specify 0.02 dB per degree C change uh, with the ambient temperature. Okay, we have two more questions that came in at this point. I think we should answer those two and then maybe move back to the presentation because we're running a little short on time. And yes. you guys have all had great questions and um, we'll have another break here shortly. But yep. the, um, the first one is how much of a change of temperature affects the calibration? Well, 0.02 dB per degree C. Yes. Okay. So to lower the noise floor for the calibration, can I increase the DVM power of the analyzer from, for instance, from negative 10 to zero DVM, will the noise floor go from negative 90 to negative 110? Yes, uh, our dynamic range as specified of the data sheet is specified at the maximum output power of the, uh, of the stimulus and uh, 10 Hertz uh, IF bandwidth. Uh, you can get another 10 dB if you go down to one hertz IF bandwidth, but that's kind of a coffee break measurement, and that's why we specify it at 10 hertz. So yes, uh, high power and low IF bandwidth for, for best dynamic range. All right. I bumped you back to the slide you were on, so next one will be TRL. Okay. Let's talk about TRL. Uh, TRL refers to through reflect line calibration. This is very interesting. It's intended, uh, it's really intended for, for full two port calibration. I don't think there's any way to do a one port TRL cal. Uh, technically, the through has to be zero length. And TRL with non zero length is called LRL. That's line reflect line. But in my opinion, that's just being fussy. Let's just call it TRL. So calibration of using TRL uh, consists of measuring a through, uh, measuring a, a reflect, and we're gonna get back to the, the gentleman who was talking about just using this with the cable open. Uh, anything at all can be used. A short, an open, uh, anything on the perimeter of the Smith chart can be used for the reflect. That means, yes, you can just leave this open. The only caveat there is that whatever you do on port one has to be done on port two. So if these two things look the same as an open, you can use this as your reflect. However, if this outer piece is a little wobbly, they might not look the same. I mean, there might be a little more capacitance with this pushed over than when this is straight up, if you know what I'm saying. So uh, the reflect, uh, it doesn't matter what you use. It's, it's wonderful. All right, uh, and then followed by the measurement of a line, which is normally 90 degrees longer than the through. If the through was zero length, then the line has to be precisely 90 degrees long at the center frequency where you're gonna perform your calibration. As I said, the very same reflect must be used for each port. So if we use just open connectors, well, let's make sure they're kind of centered like this and they're not pushed over to the side and we'll, we'll pull this a reflect and this a reflect. It would be better to use a short. Um, no characterization of the reflect is needed. Now, why is that true? Uh, sidebar, let me digress a little bit. There's, uh, there are two Smith charts. There's a Smith chart of what you're measuring, and there's a Smith chart for reality, the thing that it, that it should be, the actual measurement. How do we tie these together? Well, the thing we, the Smith chart we're measuring is bigger, perhaps, rotated, and offset. How do we get it to line up with the actual measurement? Well, we have to unrotate it, we have to move the offset, and we have to change perhaps the gain to make it the same size. Three things. How can we do that? We have an unknown circle over here and we wanna match it to, we wanna functionally map it to another circle. We need three things. Uh, we need three points on this uh, measurement circle to do that. Any three things will do. And it doesn't matter where they are, as long as they're fairly far apart. Clearly you wouldn't want three little points on the edge and you wouldn't want three little points in the middle. They have to be 
widely separated in order to clearly define the measurement circle against the actual. That's what calibration does. So you could do, yes, you could have reflect, reflect, reflect. That is possible as long as their angles are pretty widely separated on the measurement. That's why in TRL, it's possible to use any old reflect that you like. It just has to be on the, on the, outer, on the perimeter of the Smith's heart. TRL calibration will be accurate between the frequencies where the line, that was the last piece of the calibration, is between 60 and 120 degrees. That's basically 30 degrees on either side of 90. Uh, if you go below 60 or above 120 degrees, uh, you'll start to see more and more error. Uh, the line must have excellent characteristic impedance. I made my own TRL kit with uh, semi-rigid and tried it out, and it sort of worked. But the result was, uh, after I measured a, a really, really good load, was I saw 30 dB, um, a 30 dB dip, a big, con a big discontinuity where I had to switch lines to another line. And then again, it was down 25, 30 dB. So it really was quite awful. And that's because I used semi-rigid. I did not use a really, really nice 50 ohm line. Errors in the characteristic impedance will severely limit the return loss accuracy. So a, a length of regular coaxial cable is normally not good enough, just as I said. Precision airline is required for good or best calibration. And the calibration frequency can be extended by using more lines. That is, one line could be 20 to 160 degrees here at these frequencies. The next shorter line will continue 20 degrees at this frequency and 160 at a higher frequency. And they should overlap somewhat for good accuracy. So if the actual non-zero through, I did say that for TRL, the through has to be zero length. Well, for LRL, um, the through is not zero length. We might use, we might use this for uh, our uh, TRL calibration. That's not zero length. It's 30 picoseconds, 30 picoseconds as I recall. Um, so you have to, um, um, the lines will have to be 90 degrees longer than this through. But there's an interesting application. Um, if you have a non-zero through, but in the definition of the TRL kit, you set the delay of the through to zero, then when you're finished with your calibration, T, your reflex, and your 90 degree line, the result will be a reference plane that is halfway in the middle of the through. Now, why is that useful? It's normally not, but I can think of a good application on a PC board. A connectorized PC board is designed with equal length traces to and from a device under test. Create a through trace between two other connectors, which is the combined length of those two, and then create a line trace between two connectors, which is 90 degrees longer than that through, and then create your reflect, which can just be a connector with a short. Perform TRL, TRL calibration. And when you're finished, the reference plane will be right at the dot because it's right at the middle of your through. It's a beautiful thing. It takes out your connectors, takes out the traces, and it moves the reference plane right to your dot. The only caveat is that the line that you create on the board has to be a very beautiful beautiful 50 ohm line. So you'll need to characterize it, measure it, make sure it is 50 ohms. Mathematically, there are ways of fixing it if it's not precisely 50 ohms, but I don't want to get too much into that math at this time. Questions? Okay, we do have some questions. Um, how do calibration standards depend on frequency? Ah, um, well, uh, for the mechanical standards, the inductance and the, the inductance of the short and the capacitance of the open are characterized by that third order polynomial, which is, which is a function of frequency. Um, this kit is uh, 3.5 millimeter. You can tell because there's no Teflon in there. So this is good up to 26, 
gigahertz and change. It might even be a little higher on the thing. The 4311 is, is 43. Oh, so this is not even 3.5, this is 2.92. Okay, so the point is, uh, depending on the connector type, of course, uh, you're going to have, uh, you're going to be able to use this to a higher frequency. Uh, SMA is only good to 12 gigahertz uh, ish, 3.5 millimeter. Well, some people use it, uh, SMA, that's the Teflon type, up to about 18, perhaps. Um, 3.5 millimeter is good to 26 gigahertz. 2.9 uh, millimeter is good above that, and then 2.4 and so on. So the connectors, uh, connector change is required to get higher and higher because there are modes that occur uh, otherwise and the calibration would just be terrible. So uh, are they frequency dependent? Yes. Uh, the frequency dependent is completely taken care of with a database kit because you're actually measuring everything, everything that's going on over, over frequency for the open, short, and low, and through. Um, Follow-up question, how is it dependent on temperature? Oh, um, yeah, good question. The, um, uh, as I said earlier, the VNA tends to change about 0.02 dB per degree C after calibration. And uh, during, um, during calibration, we, we often say that uh, uh, in, our, in our extended specifications, it will say that the uh, uh, VNA calibration actually applies at uh, 25 degrees plus or minus five degrees, I think five degrees and change, five degrees C. Um, the reason why that statement is, now the, now the VNA will operate down to 10 degrees and up to 60 degrees. Uh, the reason why that statement is there is because that uh, there's no way for us to have NIST traceability beyond that temperature range because NIST doesn't provide that information. So, um, so are there temperature limitations uh, to be NIST traceable? You have to be like within a 10 degree window. Yes. That's all the questions we have right now. Ah, okay. Waveguide. Um, all right, looks like uh, we're getting a little short on time, but hopefully we can get through this. Uh, Waveguide, uh, we, we do a couple different kinds of calibration. We can do a, a, a short open load like calibration, it's really called um, SSL, short, short load. Um, and what, uh, what we do is uh, we basically uh, apply a shorting plate to the waveguide outputs, of uh, uh, waveguide ports, and that's our short. We put in a 90 degree shim in front of that short, and now it looks like an open, it's rotated around the Smith chart, so it looks like an open. And we apply a load, a broadband load, uh, and, and using those three objects, we can do something like an SOLT calibration. Here's the broadband load. Um, it's difficult to make, it's very expensive. And I should note, DRL requires no load, which is very nice, much less expensive. So, uh, the calibration, as I described it, is very similar to the way we did coax. Um, we, uh, uh, for uh, TRL, we, we, can put the, uh, we can put the waveguides of the two ports directly together and bolt them. That's our, uh, that's our through. We can uh, put shorting plates on each side, and that's our reflect. And then we can add a small line, which is 90 degrees long at the frequency of interest. And that's our line. And that is our TRL calibration. It's very easy. No broadband load is required. And the nice thing too is that the line being a waveguide uh, is gonna look really, really nice. It, uh, it's easier to make a, uh, a 90 degree through a waveguide than it is to make a, a precision 50 ohm uh, line in coax. Uh, do keep in mind if you're actually doing this at home that the phase length uh, of a waveguide in order to determine that 90 degrees is not linear at all, there's, an, there's this formula for the phase velocity in the waveguide. As you approach cutoff, the, the wave is bouncing quite a bit and uh, the phase length gets to, be, gets to look really long. Horn TRL calibration. 
a lot of people doing material testing are using uh, something like this uh, to do it. Uh, they'll, they'll take two horns, they'll have them facing each other, and that'll be the through. Put a plate in between, measure both sides, and that's the short or the reflect. And then remove the reflect, move one of the horns such that there's a, uh, a 90 degree change, and then that will be the line. Then you have to move it back again. And now your calibration is, as shown in my little picture here, the calibration plane is directly between the horns. So if you can, if you can contrive to put a material in there now, you can measure the uh, transmission through the material. You can measure the reflection back from the material. And from that, if you're very careful, you can, deri you can um, derive the uh, uh, dielectric constant and the dielectric loss. Um, yeah, and it's used in material measurement. Um, I'll just, uh, I, 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 knew, I said I'd throw this in at the end because it's kind of a topic all uh, to itself. Uh, through all this calibration, what is being corrected? And this is a flow diagram that shows uh, uh, the things that are being corrected. Uh, and um, if you have a look at it, there's the, the directivity of the bridge. That's the error due to the, the bridge separates the uh, outgoing and incoming signals um, and tells us which the, the magnitude of each. Uh, there's some error in that. Um, uh, the source maps, that is that our source is not precisely 50 ohms. It's going to vary a little bit with frequency. The reflection tracking, that's the frequency response uh, from the reflection from the duct through the cable, through the bridge, the digitizer. That's not perfectly flat over frequency. Uh, we also have transmission tracking, again, which I mentioned is the full frequency response through the cable, through the duct, and uh, through the whole system. Uh, the load match, again, the load on the other port two, when we're measuring through port one to port two, the load at port two is not precisely 50 ohms. It varies somewhat over frequency. And isolation, that's the signal that makes its way inside the VNA from one port to the other. Those are the errors, and those are the, those are the systematic errors that are removed by calibration. So um, we do... We designate them in this fashion, and we um, um, and we can uh, we can write the formulas for um, for how each of the calibrations that we do um, uh, removes each of these pieces. All right, we do have a question. Typical VNA specifications commonly allow for quite a few degrees of phase error at the top end of the unit's frequency range. Is this error due primarily to the quality of the calibration standards used or to hardware issues in the VNA or to other factors? Uh, um, at the highest, yeah, at the highest frequencies, um, very small mechanical, yeah, smaller mechanical changes uh, will, will generate uh, larger phase variations. So clearly when you get into milli millimeter wave, uh, measurement um, you know, changes in millimeters um, or less can cause a couple degrees very quickly. Um, so yes, uh, I would say that um, though that when you look at, when you're looking at phase uh, issues in your measurements, um, if you're if you're looking to the VNA specification, you're probably looking in the wrong place because. Uh, I would say that any measurement I make right now with this VNA, uh, most of my phase error is going to be due to these cables. These are really good cables, uh, but uh, move them a, a little bit and you're going to get phase variation. Uh, you need to spend a lot of money to get uh, um, uh, really phase stable cables. And at that point, uh, then your next step is, yeah, what's going on in the VNA? Um, the... Uh, I think that's a topic for uncertainties, which uh, is probably our next lizard lesson. Mm -hmm. That's about all I can go into today. Is it possible to avoid the ripples of the open standard in a calibration on a cryogenic probe station? Oh, um, 
if I knew anything about a cryogenic probe station, I would answer that. <laughs> Can we do some research maybe and, yeah. and get back to him? I think okay. we'll have to. All right. Yeah. Well, we will follow up afterwards yeah. with that question. Um, is there any advantage with TRL over solar at lower frequencies? Um, uh, I think that if you have um, if you have a really, really good airline for your line, um, I suspect you could get better. Um, uh, I suspect you could get a little better uh, calibration uh, because it turns out that the uh, calibration due to the load um, is primarily responsible for the limit of, uh, of, of reflection measurement accuracy. As you know, you can only measure down to about minus 25 uh, dB on an S11 or an S22 measurement, uh, whereas you can go to minus 80 or minus 90 for an S21 or an S12. The reason for that is because the directivity can only be compensated uh, up to the uh, return loss of your load. So um, if you don't have a load and you're using the, the really good characteristic components of a line instead, I think you could probably get better uh, S11 and S22 measurements. How do you calibrate if the target system is not 50 ohms, say 100 ohms? Uh, um, you can, um, if you have, if you have a defined 100 ohm calibration kit, um, then when you apply each of the standards, uh, you have to, in the, the cal calibration kit definition, you have to tell it that you're open and you're short and your loader are, are all 100 ohm uh, characteristic impedance. You'd have to have a 100 ohm characteristic impedance cable as well. And you'd have to have some kind of adapter to get from 50 ohms, mechanically from 50 ohms to 100 ohms. But if you did that um, and you calibrated with a 100 ohm calibration kit, then when you were finished, the VNA would change uh, its characteristic impedance to 100 ohms. The Smith chart would be normalized to 100 ohms, and all of your S parameters would be renormalized to 100 ohms. Uh, this is very common, actually, for 75 ohm measurements. Uh, this 50 ohm VNA, you can apply adapters that will go from 50 to 75 ohm mechanically, put on 75 ohm cables, calibrate with a 75 ohm kit, and you can make 75 ohm measurements all day long uh, with great accuracy. Okay, sorry, answering a question I could answer. Ah. Um, we have one last question here. If I'm only measuring devices up to two gigahertz, what cal kit would be appropriate? I assume the waveguide is a little too much. Ah, um, I would use a, a mechanical cal kit and uh, up to a couple of gigahertz, uh, I, would, uh, I would recommend our um, 611. Yes, uh, we have a we don't, we don't have some, well, we have an economical grade cal kit that you might look at, um, but it is an economical grade. And you need to, you need to look at its, um, you need to look at its uncertainties, determine whether it's going to do the job for you. Um, personally, I recommend uh, our, our kind of better grade cal kit, which is uh, a 611 for, uh, I think we have a 611 that works for in connectors. Um, is there a SMA for that? Don't. I don't know off the top of my head. I think I know that there's a link at the end of this for our calibration kits. So, uh, so yes, I'd recommend the uh, N611. That was great. Thank you, Brian, for presenting today and for the very informative webinar. I'd like to say thank you to all of our attendees today who made the time to sit with us for the webinar and for your participation. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, it is being recorded and we'll send out an email with the recording in the next day or so. We have a new lineup of webinars coming up on our Test Force Academy. So if you visit testforce.com slash academy, you can check it out. And we're always open to hearing your suggestions as well. So stay tuned and reach out if you'd like to. If any questions come up later, please don't hesitate to email me back or send a message to marketing at testforce.com and we'll get back to you with the answers and put you in touch with Brian if necessary. And we've, uh, we've come to the end of the session today, but I look forward to hearing from all of you and hope that you have a great day. 
Thanks again and take care.